break down pretty quickly. Government investigators were able to smuggle bomb parts onto airplanes several times this year. These security tests are detailed in a new report from the Government Accountability Office. More now on that report during this House Oversight Committee hearing. This is almost three hours. Please come to order. Today we're holding a hearing on airport security. Last year, the Government Accountability Office tested the effectiveness of airport security checkpoints by conducting undercover missions to bring explosives through airport screening security checkpoints at 21 locations. The Transportation Security Administration failed all 21 of those tests. The purpose of today's hearing is to determine whether TSA has improved over the last year. And GAO is here again to tell us about the results of its most recent investigation. This committee comes to this issue in a bipartisan manner. This investigation was jointly requested by our ranking member, Tom Davis, Benny Thompson, the chair of the Homeland Security, and myself. A bipartisan approach is critical because explosives on airplanes are a dangerous threat. In August 2006, terrorists plotted to bring liquid explosives onto eight flights bound for the United States. The British thwarted that threat, but there are new ones on the horizon. The terrorist threat to our airlines is constantly evolving. The question is, is the Transportation Security Administration keeping up? To help answer this question, we asked GAO to do another round of covert tests. Congress and the traveling public we represent have the right to know whether TSA is effectively addressing this threat. Unfortunately, the news is not good. GAO's undercover agents once again succeeded in getting dangerous materials through airport security checkpoints. Last year, the co-chairman of the 9-11 Commission spoke publicly about the fact that TSA failed GAO's tests. Thomas Keene said he was dismayed because I thought the Department of Homeland Security was making some progress on this, and evidently they are not. And Lee Hamilton stated that, quote, the fact that so many airports failed this test is a hugely important story which the American traveler is entitled to know. The Homeland Security Department promised to plug these holes, but what we will hear from GAO today is that the department is not succeeding. The Transportation Secretary Administration has had six years and has spent billions of taxpayers' dollars, yet our airlines remain vulnerable. That's an embarrassing and dangerous record. I hope today's hearing will begin to point the way toward reforms that are urgently needed. We've got to fix this problem. I want to now recognize uh, Ranking Member Tom Davis. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for uh, holding this hearing. It is indeed a bipartisan. This isn't about red or blue. It's about red, white, and blue, and defending the homeland. In several days, families in record numbers will begin their travels to celebrate Thanksgiving. For many who travel by plane, their journey will start with long lines to reach the airport and then to park. These will be followed by even longer, more agonizing lines to get boarding passes and check luggage. These will be followed by the most, most tortuous line of all, the one that leads to the Transportation Security Agency checkpoint. Since 9-11, people have become accustomed to the added security procedures associated with air travel. Although it takes longer to board an aircraft and there are more restrictions on what can be carried onto a plane, the public generally has been willing to endure these inconveniences for the benefit of safety. It is safe to say, though, that the flying public would not be so understanding if people came to believe these inconveniences do not assure security. In August of 2006, British authorities discovered a plot to blow up transatlantic aircraft using explosives made from common liquids. In response to this new threat, TSA implemented what is known as the 311 or the 311 policy which permits passengers to carry three ounces of liquids or gels aboard a plane in one quart-sized plastic bag. 
In theory, strict limits on the amount of liquids that passengers can carry will prevent a bomb from being constructed. Today, we will hear testimony from the Government Accountability Office on how its agents successfully got past TSA checkpoints at several airports with common liquids that, when combined, could have constituted an explosive device large enough to bring down a commercial aircraft. That is obviously not what Congress or the public want to hear. A little more than two years ago, I chaired a similar hearing on the adequacy of TSA's security at airports. Then TSA leaders testified the solution was more time, more resources, and better technology. They have had all three. Unfortunately, as this latest GAO report shows, TSA still cannot consistently detect or prevent prohibited items from being carried onto aircraft. We have got to do better. I understand the threat evolves as our enemies learn more about our improved security and take steps to react. TSA has to do the same. In fact, TSA can't just react. The agency has to be proactive and stay on offense. I am pleased to see Administrator Hawley in his opening statement acknowledge what GAO was able to do and the need for TSA to do better. But his words need to trigger strong actions and tangible results. Mr. Chairman, as we approach the beginning of the 2007 holiday season and the flying public begins to travel, it is important to remember the American people rely on TSA to do everything possible to ensure their safety. It is not enough to identify gaps. These gaps have to be addressed aggressively and consistently. Flying these days is stressful enough. The commercial air travel industry is straining under serious cost and performance pressures, but no one can afford to let security challenges get lost in the shuffle. We need to understand how TSA proposes to strengthen the system, increase vigilance, and deter those who seek to exploit the vulnerabilities of so fragile a network. The next baggie of prohibited liquids may not be a test. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much Mr. Uh, Davis. Ordinarily, it would be just the two of us making opening statements, but we have had a request uh, from Mr. Micah, who is the ranking member of the Legislative Committee on Transportation Issues, so I know he wants to give a statement. But let me uh, invite any member who wishes to make a statement to do so at this time. Let me recognize Mr. Micah first. First of all, uh, Mr. Waxman, you are going to probably fall out of your chair, but uh, I want to take this opportunity to uh, publicly thank you. Uh, uh, I think what you are doing today is probably one of the best uh, uh, hearings that we will do for the American public this entire year. Uh, Henry Waxman, I, I really appreciate your following up on on one of the most important uh, threats we face um, as a nation. Um, you have also done something that I was unable to do, is make the public aware of the failure of our uh, security screening system. And I think that is very, very important. In fact, I, I thought of even breaching uh, security or classified information uh, when I first uh, asked GAO, uh, when I was chairman, and you, your staff did an excellent job of detailing uh, what has taken place in previous tests and previous failures. And if, if this was just this failure, um, it would still be a problem. But this is a, unfortunately a record of failure, which you have uh, detailed and you have also made public. And this is an open society and the public has a right to know. Mr. Hawley is going to tell you about a layered security system with 19 levels of, of security. I read his testimony. The last one is the public. And I am telling you, this is one of the most serious threats that we face as, as a nation because these people are out to get us. And this has been a cat and mouse game since uh, before September 11th, uh, 2001. And, and no one should let down their guard on this. And if you just look at the history of what they've tried to do, they scoped the system in 2001. They found our vulnerabilities. We didn't have standards for screeners, that we didn't ban uh, box cutters, that we uh, didn't have rules in place uh, to deal with the hijacking of a plane, the failure of government. If you look at the sophistication of what they have done just of late, the Richard Reed shoe bomb was a very sophisticated effort to take, a, take down multiple aircraft 
If you look at the liquid uh, shoe bombs, uh, I'm sorry, if you look at the liquid bombs in the London case, uh, the same thing, a, uh, an evolving sophistication to take down multiple aircraft. And if you think 9-11 was something, folks, uh, using non-traditional explosives like, the, like Mr. Mr. Cooney and GAO has used is the, is the next step in this process. And we've tried to put in place layers of sec uh, security to deal with that. Now, I have some very specific questions because I didn't feel that the handoff to the Democrat side was, was well done. And uh, I'm going to go into the details of the meeting that took place when we really handed this off to the, uh, the, the other team who has the same interest that, that I had. And I don't think that they got the, the full story. And today we're gonna hear the full story due to what Mr. Waxman has been able to make public. So finally, the, the good thing about what this is this is going to do is make the public aware that they are the last link in this. We put other links and, he'll, and Mr. Hawley will describe them, not as fast and not as well as, uh, with technology or training of personnel or placement of personnel to deal with this situation. But we do have a failure of a system uh, and uh, it, it needs to be publicly known and the public can help us in this because they can be alert even in I, uh, probably the best thing that they're going to deal with today is congested aircraft, uh, which will uh, uh, mean that those planes are full, but they're full of Americans and people who can help us in an effort to detect this, this threat, and you're going to hear more about it. So, Mr. Waxman, uh, I thank you on behalf of the American people for what, what you're doing today and making them aware and they're going to have to be partners with us uh, to make certain that we don't repeat uh, a, a national uh, catastrophe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Micah. Let me call in any other member. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Chairman, um, I, want to, I too thank you for holding this hearing, and I, I am glad that it is truly a bipartisan hearing. I, like Mr. Micah, uh, is a senior, am a senior member of the Transportation Committee, and. Uh, I am chairman of the, of the, uh, the Coast Guard uh, subcommittee. We spend a phenomenal amount of time and resources trying to guard our ports. And it seems that we had taken for granted while we were trying to make sure our ports were safe that our air ports were very safe. Um, and the fact is, is that so many people, um, you know, when I think about GAO testing 21 airports, uh, last year and getting through every single one of them. I didn't say uh, 20 of them, I said every single one of them. You know, it makes you wonder. Um, the fact is, is that my constituents are paying more for airline tickets and part of the increase in price is to cover the TSA. And then they, of course, stand in the long lines and they are very patient. Uh, everybody from the little children to senior citizens going through all kinds of procedures um, and only to find out that um, we could do better. Mr. Chairman, a few years ago, many years ago when I visited Israel, they had a, I'll never forget a statement that uh, they said uh, to me and I, and I, I, it's something that I've thought about a lot. And what they said was, if we are not better, we will not be. If we are not better, we will not be. And I think we have to be better. Um, and I think we can do better. Americans across the country will be traveling next week for Thanksgiving holiday and, and uh, they're going to go through a lot. But they will be under the assumption that they are safe because they see what they go through. And so I'm hoping that this hearing will uh, shed some light but most important, I'm hoping that it will let us discover what the true problems may be. Are we mired in an atmosphere of mediocrity? Are we in need of better detection equipment? Uh, is there human error issues here? I, I don't know. We need to find out all of these things uh, so that we can be the very best that we can be. And we must, by the way, have very, very high expectations. It is in the DNA of every cell of my brain and probably Americans, every American's brain, seeing those planes on 
fly into the World Trade Centers. And we never want that to happen again. And so, Mr. Chairman, I think this hearing will go a long way towards making sure that we are better. Because if we are not better, we will not be. And that with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummings. Any other member wish to be recognized? Mr. Shays. Thank you. A 30-second intervention to thank you, Mr. Chairman, as well, uh, and uh, working with Mr. Davis and Mr. Thompson. Uh, uh, this, the, the issue for me uh, was heightened in the early, late 80s when a plane was blown out of the sky because of uh, a drug a terrorists who were uh, involved. And we were shown back in the early 90s that just a, a, a bottle of gin with a, a basically liquid explosives next to a radio, next to a carton of cigarettes. And the radio was the detonator. Uh, and, it was, uh, and it had a, and another one was just a mat on the bottom of a, a suitcase that was uh, explosive, uh, non-detectable. I'll just end by saying what is extraordinarily alarming to me is this isn't 21 uh, break-ins, in a sense, out of 100. This is 21 out of 21, and that to me is extraordinarily unsettling and makes me question uh, whether we're going to see any success in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again. Well, thank you, Mr. Shea. Does any other members wish to be recognized? If not, I want to welcome our witnesses here today. We have us, with us Mr. Gregory D. Kutz, the Managing Director, Forensic Audits and Special Investigations from the Government Accountability Office accompanied by Mr. John Cooney, Assistant Director, Forensic Audits and Special Investigations, Government Accountability Office, and the Honorable Edmund Kip Hawley, the Administrator of the Transportation Security Administration. We are uh, grateful to you for being here today. It's the practice of this committee that all testimony is taken under oath, so I'd like to ask you if you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Uh, the record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, Mr. Kutz, I want you to uh, start off. Your prepared statements, all of you, will be in the record, and we'd like to ask you to try to limit the oral presentation. We won't be strict about this, but we will have a clock that will indicate when the five minutes is up. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss airport security. In March of 2006, we reported that investigators boarded commercial aircraft with explosive devices in their carry-on luggage. At the request of this committee, we performed additional covert testing of airport security in 2007. Today's testimony highlights the results of our testing. It is important to note that we work closely with TSA to ensure that my testimony does not have any classified or sensitive security information. My testimony today has two parts. First, I will discuss what we did, and second, I will discuss the results of our covert test. First, using information available on the Internet, we were able to identify devices that could severely damage an aircraft and jeopardize the safety of its passengers. The first device was an improvised explosive device, or IED, containing two parts. The first part, a liquid explosive. The second part, a low-yield detonator. Our 2006 work showed that the detonator itself could function as an IED. However, using this detonator to ignite the liquid explosive results in a more powerful device. The second device was an improvised incendiary device, or IID. These types of devices do not explode, but instead create intense fire, heat, and noxious fumes. Our incendiary device was created by combining products prohibited by TSA from carry-on luggage. The components for both of our devices were purchased at local stores and on the internet for less than $150. We tested the effectiveness of our devices in partnership with a local law enforcement agency and at a national laboratory. As you requested, I will show a short video at the end of my presentation that shows the results of these tests. As the video will show, 
our devices could cause severe damage to an aircraft and threaten the safety of its passengers. <clears throat> Using only publicly available information, which we do for all of our covert testing, we devised methods to conceal the components for these devices in our carry-on luggage and on our persons. As with all FSI testing, this was a covert or red team test. In other words, very few people at GAO knew what we were doing, and nobody at TSA was aware in advance of our testing. Moving on to our results, we successfully passed through TSA checkpoints with components for several explosive devices and an incendiary device. These prohibited items were concealed in our carry-on luggage and on our persons. Our testing was done at 19 airports across the country, including those that employ private screeners. We found no difference in the results for TSA employees and the privately contracted screening employees. In most cases, security officers, officers appeared to follow TSA procedures. However, we did identify several vulnerabilities. For example, most travelers are aware of the 311 rule prohibiting certain liquids and gels aboard the aircraft. We were able to bring a liquid component of the incendiary device through checkpoints undetected by studying policies related to this process. Also in two instances, our investigators were selected for a secondary inspection. However, in both cases, the security officer did not detect the prohibited items that our investigators carried on board the aircraft. One of our suggestions for TSA is to consider improved search techniques, including enhanced pat-downs. In conclusion, our testing shows that a terrorist group using publicly available information could bring explosive and incendiary devices on board an aircraft undetected. TSA faces the monumental challenge of balancing security with the efficient movement of passengers. Our work clearly shows the increased security risk of the current policy of allowing substantial carry-on luggage aboard aircraft. Absent changes in the carry-on policy, we believe that risks can be reduced through improvements in human capital, processes, and technology. As you requested, we will now show a short video, and I want to just briefly discuss what the video will show. The first part of the video is the IED detonator I described, which you will see used on an automobile. The second part of the video is the liquid explosive, which is ignited by the IED detonator. And the third part will be the incendiary device that I mentioned. So if we could show the video.
Mr. Chairman, this ends our statement. Special Agent Cooney and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Cooney, you're, you'll be, uh, did you have a statement or? Uh, uh, no, question? I don't, Mr. Chairman, but I'll be able to answer your questions at appropriate time. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Holly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Davis, members of the committee. Uh, I also thank you for uh, having this hearing and drawing attention to these issues. I particularly appreciate the work uh, of the chairman and uh, the ranking member and their staffs, along with my colleagues from the GAO, to protect sensitive information. And I think this is, as Mr. Micah mentioned, uh, an extraordinarily important issue that we deal with um, openly <clears throat> and transparently. The, the, the videos that we saw uh, a minute ago and the, the play on the television are noteworthy and, and certainly get your attention. I think the, the key point to it is there are vulnerabilities in every system of security and that what we're engaged in is risk management. And as we look at risk management, it looks at an IED that would have the capacity of taking an airplane down. And there are many, many, many steps, including making the bomb, getting components through, perhaps assembling them, all, all those various steps. And we look at the whole system. And the 19 um, layers of security that, I, uh, that Mr. Micah mentioned and I put in my uh, opening statement are like numbers in a combination lock. And if you find one number to a 19 number combination, you have one number. And what we've done is identify and understand the vulnerabilities in our system, and there are vulnerabilities, and then put in place other layers to compensate for them. I'd like to um, just give a quick uh, summary. In August of 2005, we identified, I came on the job in July 2005, and we looked at what are the vulnerabilities. We looked at the technology vulnerabilities, we looked at the people vulnerabilities, and we looked at our strategy vulnerabilities. And we identified that we had work to do in all three areas. We needed to dramatically upgrade the technology that we have at checkpoints for the point of eliminating the possibility of bringing on IED components, not the assembled bomb, but the components, a much, much more difficult task. So, we retrained the entire TSA workforce with professional bomb techs directed at that and changed our protocols to require us to train and test to the standard of IED components. And to put these tests in, uh, in context, and I appreciate the work, they're, they're done for good purpose, they yield valuable information, but it is important to stay focused not get panicked by looking at one particular number in that combination lock and worrying about the whole system. There are issues that need to be addressed and, and I welcome discussing them. But to put it in context, if the number of tests that the GAO did for this were measured in miles, there were 38 tests, that would be roughly from here to Baltimore. The Office of Inspector General has done roughly 200 tests. This is in a three month period this, of this year. That is approximately from here to Philadelphia. And in a three month period at TSA, we do 225,000 tests. These are physical tests with actual bomb components going through with real people smuggling through the checkpoint. That's the equivalent of going around the world eight times. So I think the trip to Baltimore, one can learn interesting things. But what we do every day, and the 225,000 over three months, or over a million a year, gives us very focused information on what we know terrorists work on, we know their capability, we focus our efforts on what will actually take down a plane, as opposed to what might severely damage. I mean, my pen can do severe damage, we look at what can take a plane down and work back from there, each one layer. So yes, there are vulnerabilities in technology. I'll, I'll address what we're doing about those. So we've put aside um, a significant amount of money to buy new AT machines, new checkpoint carry-on machines, and we've announced a purchase of 250 already in October. We expect to double that 
using fiscal 08 funds should the Congress appropriate that money and the bill be signed. But 08, we expect to move that number up to 500. There, to give you an idea, there are about 2,500 lanes in the United States, 500 and some checkpoints. So this is a very, very significant technology upgrade that we'll be deploying in 08 that'll be the first significant technology upgrade since the 1970s on, on carry-on luggage. That is in progress. We identified it early, and now, fortunately, it's, uh, it's being deployed. On the strategy, we said this identified in 2005. We are too checklist oriented. If our TSOs are looking to find a certain number of prohibited items and pull them out of bags, they're not thinking ahead. And I think, as, as Mr. Davis mentioned, we have to go on offense. We can't sit back at the checkpoint looking through a prohibited items list and fishing out people's objects. We have to be aware that they change their technique. When we move one direction, they'll find a way around it. We have to play offense. We have to be nimble. And that's why we do so many of these other IED component tests at our checkpoints every day, every shift, every airport. It is the, it is the crux of what we do. Then we said, in addition to being um, more flexible, better technology, we need to change up what we do. We can't be sit a sitting duck at the checkpoint with the same process. We've added layers. We've added the behavior, behavior observation layer. We've added, uh, which is for people to identify suspicious behavior, such as you'd find with surveillance or pre-attack planning. They're not bringing prohibited items. They're not breaking any laws. They're there doing their surveillance, feeling they're protected because we can't get them because they're not carrying prohibited items. Not true anymore. Step in the U.S. airport, we have 600 behavior detection officers out there, and they will pick you off in the public area. Then on top of that, we've added the ticket document checker with the support of the Congress, and I appreciate that, to take over the critical point at which somebody shows up and shows identification. Now we have federal officers there checking that identity who have much better briefing, who can then tie in with the behavior piece. On top of that, we've added our Viper teams, which bring our federal air marshals who are not flying on aircraft. They are now able to move undercover and overtly to do unexpected patrols everywhere in the airport environment. And we also work, I should say, with our transit partners to help there too. On top of that, we've added a program in the back of airports where we have the equivalent of a thousand headcount now that we've developed to spend their time in the back side of airports. We're not just sitting at the checkpoint. We're looking at what are employees doing in the back, what's happening at the fuel dump. We're looking at what's happening in the parking garage. We're looking at who's driving into the airport. All of those things are now added. Those are additional layers that have been added since 2005. So we addressed, we identified the vulnerabilities in 2005. I told you on the technology, we're after that with AT and the, and the millimeter wave, I should say, and backscatter, whole body imaging, that gets us out of this pat-down uh, issue. And, it, and the GAO mentioned enhanced pat-downs. Well, we know what that means. The TSA officers can do very enhanced pat-downs. It has not been acceptable to the public. If that is something that we have to do, we will do that. The better answer is millimeter wave or backscatter, which allow people and have privacy protections to go through and eliminate that possibility. So technology, we fix that. Now the most important, the people. The RTSOs, um, we've, we've trained them, I mentioned that. We, we have career progression now where our employees can move up and, and enhance their skills. We have a pay for performance program, um, our attrition is dramatically down, our attendance is up, and the uh, people who flew on August 10th know that RTSOs stood up that day and changed the entire security process overnight. And that is not an easy thing to do. That is nimble, it is fast, it shows a commitment by our, our security officers. So we know our vulnerabilities, we are addressing them, and we need one more thing, and that is the support of the public. And Mr. Micah mentioned this, and I think it is absolutely critical. We need the passengers back in the game. We are on the same side and we need your help. Our officers come to work at 4 a.m. They came to TSA, they are coming to the airport to protect you. We need your help. This is not uh, something to be uh, gamed. We need you to separate out when you pack your bag. Be very clear. Here's the, the components of what I'm bringing on and let the officer quickly assess that's not a problem. The more we give clean bags to our TSOs, the less 
places there are to hide if you're a terrorist. So we ask the help on participating. We ask the help on the respect and the appreciation for our officers who are doing a great job. And I have to say, having worked with my international partners, that I believe the transportation security officers that we have are the best in the world. And the layers of security that we've added are more than other countries. And I've been to have many discussions with a lot of these countries. And we work closely to align our security measures. And one last point on 311, it not only works for us, but it was adopted by 170 countries around the world. The EU announced it and followed our lead. We are, we are working together with our partners. So we need to partner with our public. We need to partner with our international colleagues. And we need to be very direct in saying, yes, there are vulnerabilities. We can't be squeamish and say, oh my goodness, they brought some firecrackers through and put it in the trunk of a car. Well, you know what? That's something we, you have to face up to and say, we need to stop all things, but we have to focus on what truly does us harm. So I appreciate the committee's uh, time and look forward to answering your questions. Well, thank you very much uh, for the testimony. And Mr. Hawley, we want you to be successful. The American people are willing to do whatever is necessary uh, you, you, you can see that every day at an airport where people wait patiently. And when the change was made about liquids, people became uh, attuned to it and wanted to cooperate. And I appreciate your appeal to people to uh, even cooperate further. But while that all sounds very good, we still have this report, which is extremely troubling. And it follows another report a year ago where we found that uh, in 21 out of 21 incidents where GAO sent people to get on the planes, they were able to get through. Um, Mr. Uh, Coates and Mr. Cooney, you heard uh, Mr. Hawley's testimony. He says he has additional layers now. It's not just bringing in something that's not appropriate. They're looking for the most serious, the most serious thing that could be brought in that might lead to taking down an airplane. Uh, did you and your people that uh, did this study, did they take something that was serious enough to take down an airplane? Again, you, the only way to determine that is actually to have an airplane. But you saw the video, you saw some of the explosions, certainly would cause severe damage to an aircraft and potentially harm some of the passengers. And whether it would bring an aircraft down, we don't have an aircraft to actually prove that. But certainly uh, people we have consulted with, that there is a possibility. I mean, what's going to happen at that many feet above the in the air, I don't really know, but it, I think it's serious enough that, and I think that they would agree that uh, this is a serious threat. And Mr. Hawley did mention that in his opening statement, so uh, I think we are in it's agreement a with that. Threat. Now, uh, the airports were they just uh, in one airport, or how many different airports were um, used for the uh, GAO investigation? Well, as you mentioned, last year we did 21, and this year we did 19. And each of the airports, two of our investigators went through, and as we always have. We have cover teams, so there's a follow investigators in case our investigators uh, run into any trouble. But so we did, uh, I guess, um, double the number of airports, so 80 tests over two years. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you did this first test uh, uh, last year in 2006, and that was requested by Congressman Micah. And in that investigation, GAO conducted undercover tests in 21 airports. After you delivered your report, it was leaked to the media and the results were broadcast on national television. I want to play a clip from NBC the Nightly News. On, this was on March 16, now. 2006. Imagine this. Inside a passenger plane. Government sources tell NBC News that federal investigators recently were able to carry materials needed to make a similar homemade bomb through security screening at 21 airports. In all 21 airports tested, no machine, no swab, no screener anywhere stopped the bomb materials from getting through. Even when investigators deliberately triggered extra screening of bags, no one stopped these materials. We briefed Governor Tom Kane, chair of the 9-11 Commission, on the results. 
I'm appalled, I'm dismayed, and yes, to a degree, it, it does surprise me because I thought the Department of Homeland Security was making some progress on this, and evidently they're not. Investigate. Well, when that uh, report came out, Mr. Hawley, you testified, and your response to last year's investigation was that TSA was implementing new training measures that had not yet, quote, burned into your transportation security officers. You promised that things were going to get better. Do our op airports continue to have security vulnerabilities? I, I'm, I'm pretty disturbed by the GAO report. Uh, should the American people feel that you're, in, you're going to be able to control this and protect the, protect the yes. traveling public? Yes, yes. The American public uh, can be confident traveling with a security system in place. And, and you mentioned uh, my testimony previously saying we were moving in that direction. We have accomplished that, and, and those were the, um, the distributing the extra uh, uh, bomb-making kits, basically, the training devices to every airport, all the checkpoints. That is in place. That is operating today, and it, it is part of the training improvement effort. It, it works both ways because you get the guy who is, who is doing the test to figure out how could I beat this my own system. Then they get somebody, another federal agent unknown, to bring it through, and then the the, the TSO identifies it, in which case they, they congratulate them, or they don't, in which case they train them. Well, let me ask, since my time is up, Mr. Kutz and Mr. Cooney, should, based on your investigation, the public think that our airports are secure? Well, I think Mr. Hawley is correct. There's a broader um, picture to this, including the intelligence. The best prevent here is to keep the terrorists from getting to the airport in the first place, and I, I firmly believe that. I, I don't know if he necessarily agrees with that permanently, but I think that's the solution to this. And once you're at the airport, there's a lot of other layers here. But I would point out with respect to the 06 and 07 tests that the components that we brought through, and I'm not allowed to say how often we got through, but the components we brought through both times were the same. Plus, in 07, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we had the liquid explosive in addition to those. So again, I don't know what processes were put in place between 06 and 07, but uh, I don't think they were necessarily effective totally in looking at what we were talking about. Still a discouraging result. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to ask a unanimous consent request that a letter that I sent to uh, then Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez, March 28, 2006, in regard to the leaks uh, uh, which uh, took place, uh, which you, you just showed there. And I have a resp um, partial response in September from the Department of Justice. Without objection, the documents you wish to put in the record will be made part of the record. And Mr. Davis? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, just to, uh, I'm not trying to put in something to cover the administration. They never, they never proper properly responded or investigated the leaks which, which revealed national security information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Davis. Um, Mr. Kutz and, and Mr. Cooney, let me just ask, a lot of the material we're talking about came through. This was gels and liquids. Is that correct? Was Some. Some. Yes, sir. So, uh, no gels. Okay. And right now, if you go through metal detectors, there's no way really to detect the liquids. Is that fair to say? I, I can't go into the, uh, the, the methods we used, but um, they were... We were, I'm not saying everything. I'm, look, I'm just saying, as, as I, if I were to walk, let me ask this: If I were to walk through a metal detector today uh, that you have at the airport, that doesn't necessarily uh, get li at liquids. Is that correct? No, it does not pick up liquids. So, if I have a vial in my pocket with four ounces or five ounces of liquid, and uh, it wouldn't be detect going through the detector, is that fair to say? It's fair to say, depending on what the material the vial is made up of. But in some cases, some of the so, so some of the things that could be used to uh, assemble a bomb or an IED would not be detected. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. David, we did, as I mentioned in my opening statement, some of the things we brought through the checkpoints were carried on our persons. And right. so I think that addresses so that is a So that, that is a hole right now. Is that correct? Absolutely. The, person, the object on a person is something that needs mitigation. But the, the question is, overall, if there is a vulnerability one place, such as the magnetometer, what are you doing elsewhere to make up for it? No, I understand. And, you are, and, and some people you do pull aside and pat yeah. down, and, and, I, and you have intelligence and you have everything combined. 
but it didn't work with the GAO. That's, that's I guess, my question. So that's. Yeah, well, there are two ways to improve what we do um, in the walkthrough. One is the millimeter wave answer or the backscatter, which is a technology answer, has some privacy issues, highly effective, but very good. The other is the enhanced pat down, uh, as the GAO has suggested, which is, uh, has some uh, very significant concerns in the American public. Our officers are capable of doing it, uh, but those would be the two directions to go for closing any vulnerability that specifically you mentioned. Obviously, there are other ones in oh, front and behind. Right. I just want to focus on that because yeah. that's, under, I think, understandable to, 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 to at least I understand it. Um, do we have any technology that can discern banned liquids and gels from those that are okay? Yes. Okay. And are we working on equipment and machinery that may be able to detect that? Yes. We have purchased 200 already, and we're purchasing an additional 400 in FY08 should the appropriations bill go through. And, and Ms. Cruz, if, if that were to be an operation, that would really cut down on the vulnerability, would it not or no? I, would, I don't know enough about those machines to tell you for sure. I mean, okay. I would defer to Mr. Hawley because he knows what we brought through, so he would be able to answer that question. Okay. You feel that would significantly cut down on some of the... Very, very significantly add to the risk management. Um, if the technology does not exist today, uh, are we taking a chance by allowing liquids and gels even in, lim in limited amounts aboard a plane uh, at this point, I mean, as we look at today? It is a risk management uh, process, and we did originally ban everything. I remember. That was before we understood in detail all aspects of uh, what uh, the terrorists were planning. And we have shared that with our international partners and had, have come to the agreement of all of us based on intelligence and science uh, and security issues that the 311 is effective because if you ban all liquids, then you're putting a lot more pressure on the, on the check baggage system. And that can create its own problems right. in terms of just even the volume of check bags. Well, I, in, and look, getting a Diet Coke or something, is, if, if it's labeled and you buy it inside, shouldn't be a problem. And that's a huge increase. Since the limitations on gels and liquids uh, came out of the UK threat last year, what, to, what does the UK do to address the threat in terms of screening passengers for liquids and gels? Well, one of the things is uh, allow one carry on bag, not one plus one as we do in the United States. So that was one thing. I should say we are in constant communication with the UK on all of these matters and uh, we, are, we are of common mind and common strategy. In fact, we, we're, we're both buying um, these advanced x-ray machines for Checkpoint, both uh, working on, on the millimeter wave and both uh, develop the 311. That's a different question. Uh, how does, uh, in Israel, how do they handle this threat? They have a, um, a, a different security process in that they have one, uh, one major international airport. So they go, um, they've got a very aggressive, I think, as you know, the, the questioning on the out front and uh, if they are doing a pat down, it's significantly different from what you get in the United States. Let me just ask finally, if, the, if mandatory pat downs were in place, let me ask Mr. Kutz, if, if, if mandatory pat downs were in place, would you have likely been caught at least uh, uh, during the, the banned substances that were hidden on the bodies? I, I would I'll let Mr. Cunha, I think it depends on the person doing the pat down. It depends on the aggressiveness and what parts of the body are patted down. Uh, with the pat downs that they have in place right now, TSA implements, uh, I believe we would not have been caught. Okay. Thank it you. has to be changed. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Cummings? Yeah, this is, uh, this testimony is very troubling. Um, and I'm wondering um, whether we have some low expectations here. Um, Mr. Kutz, is it? Yes, sir. You are, I guess for you all to conduct these tests, you know what procedures are in place. And we use only publicly available information, so to the extent that it's something we've either observed going through an airport or see on the Internet, uh, we try not to do our tests with any insider information. Okay, so you so you just like Joe Citizen. Yes, sir. As he, that might be even worse. What I'm saying is, so you, you, you were able to, uh, but you, what was your expectations? I guess that's what I'm wondering. Because I hear Mr. Holly talk about 
and I still don't fully understand it, the combination lock and the 19 layers. And, but the bottom line is this stuff still got on the plane. Duh. It got on the plane. It actually did not get on the plane. It didn't? In theory, it might have. But in theory, I can dunk a basketball. No, it did get on the plane. I would disagree with that. Uh, it got yeah. on the plane. Not what you saw in the video. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse, excuse me, gentlemen. I, I'm, let me just, I'll, I'll come back to you, Mr. Howell, because I want to be fair. Did the items get on the plane that you, when you conducted some tests and you showed some, the results of devices, the kinds of things that you were able to get on the plane, did those things get on the plane? Yes. Okay. And Mr. Harley, as I listen to your testimony, you talk about, you know, all of these layers. Can you explain that combination lock thing again you to bet. me? Because I, I missed that one. Okay. So you start, it, what does it take to do a catastrophic terrorist act? You have to, you have to plan it. You have to procure the materials necessary to do it. You might communicate with other conspirators. All of those represent opportunities to stop the attack if you're, if you're tightly lined up with intelligence and law enforcement. Then you might have to travel to go to, uh, to a training camp or to come to the United States or travel in the U.S. That's an opportunity. Then there's the surveillance. They're, they're going to have to see what it is they want to do. There is an opportunity. I got you. Now let's, let's fast forward to the checkpoints. You bet. How important are the checkpoints? Very important. And would you say that they are the most, most important? No. I mean, okay. So if the security checkpoints, are, they, they're, they're, they're critical though, is that right? No, I think that's one of the problems is that Americans focus that the whole thing is the checkpoint and the security system is a layered security system because if they say the checkpoint is all buttoned down, then the attack comes through the perimeter. The attack comes in front of the airport. There's a man pad attack. There are thousands of ways to attack, and if you put all your resources at the checkpoint to make that bulletproof, they say thank you very much and go someplace else to get in. So you have to secure the entire environment at a basic level, and then you have to upgrade in an unexpected, unpredictable way. Well, let way. me ask you this. Let me ask you this. All these people are going to, they're standing in these long lines, everybody in this room. They're, gonna, they're standing in long lines thinking that the checkpoints are critical. Are you telling me that they're not? I'm telling you they are a piece of the puzzle, and the lines are not extraordinarily long, and I, I expect next week we're going to be tested by the largest uh, load of passengers, and I've, I'm looking forward to the challenge, and our officers are looking forward to the challenge. Now, the other layers of security you refer to deal mostly with intelligence gathering. Um, and the certain individuals, making sure that certain individuals don't get to security checkpoints in the first place. Are you talking about racial profiling? No, 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 no. No, because terrorists use people who, uh, who specifically don't, quote unquote, look like terrorists. And so... If you, if you rely on what you think a terrorist looks like, you're going to miss them. Well, I, I can tell you, Mr. Hawley, it seems like at the rate we're going, um, and I, I really didn't expect the, the testimony that you provided us, because it sounds like we are almost, I mean, you, you're saying that, I think, that you know we can, you think we can do better, but we're just going to have to tread water until we get there. No, 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 no. We have to do better every day, and that's why we do all these tests. That's why every test every day to, to improve, but we have to stay ahead of the threat because if we just focus on what we saw in the video, yes, we can guarantee that that won't happen. But doesn't it upset you? And doesn't that upset you that 19 of 19 or whatever it was could get through and get on the plane? No, I th I think that it is instructive and helpful and a data point. But as I said, we do 200 and we we do 2,500 a day every day, and we target it to our vulnerabilities. We know what they are. Those tests allow us then to close the, the gap. Frankly, some of the stuff we saw here is not a concern, honestly. There is some of it that is a concern. And so we focus on the piece that could do ser you know, catastrophic damage. You take an airplane down. That's what we go after. And we know that if somebody goes up and puts on a, a flash in the, in the plane, 
that is not a good thing. They'll be arrested and the other passengers will certainly take it out on them. But it's not, we're not going to put our resources against things that, that are scientific demonstrations. We're looking for the terrorists. The terrorists are, are very smart. They know what takes a plane down. And that's where they're going, and that's the enemy we have to stop. We, we like the coaching and the information we get from the GAO. Very helpful, good partner, but it, it doesn't get to the point of what the terrorists are doing. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Micah? Thank you. In two, end of 2005, I asked GAO to conduct studies and tests uh, of uh, performance of TSA. There are three types of testing that have gone on. One is uh, the Inspector General of uh, Homeland Security, uh, TSA, uh, it tests itself, and then independent uh, GAO. And I've asked, I asked GAO. I asked GAO because uh, I was made aware, uh, and again, uh, we're in a deadly a very deadly game, but uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that they are trying to take uh, terrorists or folks who want to take us out are looking for the next level of vulnerability. We're always putting something in place that deals with the last uh, incident. What disturbed me about this 2006 leak, uh, and I don't know who leaked this, but after you can concluded your tests, and before I even got a copy of the tests, information was leaked. Uh, uh, Ms. Mr. Waxman showed it here. Does, do you know uh, anyone who leaked this, uh, Mr. Cooney or Mr. Cutts? No, no okay. one's aware, and uh, FBI did not do an investigation based upon yours and the Comptroller General's request. Okay. What disturbed me in that is because this information was given to me, uh, it was to be given to me, and I did learn of the failure. And the fa this, this failure is not new that you just uh, uh, released in your report. Is that correct? The failure, this, this, this failure is not new. It, it mirrors what took place uh, in your last test a, a year ago. That it I mirrors it plus the liquid explosive we mentioned. Okay. And one of the reasons I, I ask you to conduct the test because I, TSA had not conducted those kind of tests. Isn't that correct, Mr. Hawley? We started doing liquid tests in 06, before the liquid plot in the UK. When we met in April of uh, this year, I asked you if you had done similar tests to what GAO had done, and you had said uh, yes. Then you came back and you told me you had to correct it with a meeting when we had the handoff to Mr. Costello and the other side. Then you came back and you tell me, no, you corrected yourself. Which is, which is the case? Well, the GAO has done a number of different types of testing, so it gets into the technical. Well, again, the, the specific type of test that we that, saw displayed here. You the, had not, you had done that or you had not done that? If we're talking about chemicals, yes. If we're talking about the exact same chemicals, not no. Not sort of non-traditional explosives, which I, consider our, our biggest threat uh, at, at this time. You were at that meeting. Um, the, other, the other thing that, uh, was at the meeting is they sort of poo-pooed, TSA sort of poo-pooed the results of that explosion with that material. Yes, sir. Uh, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Have you had that material uh, tested to see if it would do uh, catastrophic damage? Uh, yes, sir. We've had uh, what was the result? two independent uh, opinions on that, and the results are that placed in the appropriate uh, place on an aircraft, and I can't say where that is at this hearing, that right. it could possibly do catastrophic damage. Okay. See, and I'm not, I'm not out to, to Mr. Hawley. I, I just was disturbed by, again, uh, uh, not not giving the other side as they took over all the information. I, I, I yeah. wish folks had, I wish I could talk more about that. But uh, okay, Th we failed. Uh, now, of course, when I learned this, I would have been negligent too if we didn't do something or Mr. Hawley didn't do something. And he learned about this back a year ago. We know what, what, what can uh, make up for 
problems at the checkpoint. One, we started putting behavior analysis people in place. We still don't have that done, do we? Mr. Yes, Trump? we do. Is it? Is it 2,000. Uh, at every uh, checkpoint? We, the President sent on a budget amendment last week, so we will be able to do... But it's not done yet. I mean, well, I, we I'm have, not giving you a hard time. I just want to say that, that we, we learned that. Okay, 600 when, you did, in place. when you did your test at the, most recently at the 21 airports, uh, Mr. Hawley, do you know how many of those had our, our new protocol? I do not. Alpha? I mean, what? in terms of the BDOs, are you talking about BDOs or the 311? the behavior analysis trained personnel that we started putting in place yeah. after we learned that the technolo uh, technology in place would not yeah. handle this. Do not know. I think we got, we've got to know. I, I want to know uh, how many of those people. Uh, that, that should have been the first thing we did is find out if what we put in place failed. That's just, I can't accept that. I mean, that's beyond belief that we would not know that what, what we put in place. Now, the technology is there also to deal with some of these non-traditional explosives. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Gentlemen's could time. Could I have an additional uh, minute by unanimous consent? <laughs> well, well, if you want to make one last okay. question, do it. But uh, <laughs> you said nice things about me, so I'm going to give you <laughs> Uh, now, one of the, the last things, my last question is going to be, you test, um, Mr. Hawley, uh, your, pers your personnel on performance. USA reported in October uh, statistics that have been publicly made available. Maybe they were classified, but they're here. What's, what concerns me even more, and I have the past performance levels uh, this seems to indicate that, the, that there is uh, not improvement. In fact, it looks like we're, we're, uh, we have uh, lost ground in, in passenger screening. No. And let's be clear. So if you want good scores, I'll deliver you good scores. What we're saying is well, we're, we're going to take on the toughest assignment, which is they're bringing improvised explosive devices in component parts, and we're going to train and test against that and that is really, really hard, and I would suggest there might be any f number of facilities within 10 miles of here that would have a very difficult time to, to detect all these things. We are f focused on the toughest, toughest part of it. We train and test on it. That article was something about training. It wasn't, there, there was not data in there about test results. Thank you, Mr. Thank Micah. You. Uh, I'm confused about one point, just to clarify for the record. Uh, Mr. Cummings asked whether the materials got on the plane. And as I understand, Mr. Kutz, you said yes, and then, Mr. Hawley, you said no. What would be the basis for your saying that on GO, GAO tests that didn't get onto the plane? My understanding is that what was in the video was not what was brought through the checkpoint. And the reason that's significant is that you would have had to um, assemble the bomb past the checkpoint. And there are measures in place between the checkpoint and, uh, and the aircraft that would make it more difficult for somebody to therefore get there. So as I said, you can get through a piece of it, like for instance, you can get a piece through the checkpoint perhaps, but there are other barriers on the way. And I just wanted to make clear, it was not a completed um, IED that went through and got on the aircraft. Well, we're talking about GAO's evaluation. Mr. Chairman, what was uh, the situation? We did not after we got through the checkpoint, we did not construct the device. We brought all the components onto the aircraft. That is to say that we could not have constructed it on the aircraft. We could have s simply gone into the laboratory on the aircraft once the plane was airborne and constructed the device there. Thank so we did bring all the components onto the aircraft. We did get on the plane. Mr. Higgins? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, uh, just a couple of observations. Uh, Mr. Hawley, you had indicated at the beginning that TSA officers, you know, have the, the best interests of the flying public in mind and that the flying public should be more presumably tolerant of uh, the work that it is that uh, TSA does to protect them. The thing that kind of concerns me about this uh, panel is that there seems to be an adversarial relationship 
between TSA and the Government Accounting Office, uh, where, in fact, uh, my sense is you have the same primary objective, and that is to protect the public and the flying public uh, in this particular circumstances. circumstance. I understand that there are layers uh, of security and that risk management is not a perfect science, uh, that you have to not only take into consideration possibility, but also probability. Um, so when I look over the testimony and this seemingly adversarial history that exists between TSA and GAO, uh, that fundamentally raises some questions and concerns because my sense is the GAO, GAO is not uh, conducting this to embarrass anybody, but knowing that a security system in its many layers is an evolving process uh, that takes into consideration information that may not have been presumed when originally uh, security systems were put in place, that it has to be flexible, it has to be elastic, it has to be evolving. Your thoughts? I uh, I'd, I'd just like to say, the, um, yeah, although we are definitely sparring a little bit today, we, we are, have a surprisingly uh, good relationship in that um, the reason I've said certain things was to have the record be clear, because I think it, it is a key point, the difference between catastrophic failure and, and something unsafe on the aircraft. I think it is we are absolutely in lockstep in terms where we end up. I think we agree w strongly with GAO's suggestions as what goes forward and um, the value that they bring is in some other areas other than the ones that I'm disputing. So um, I, I think it's, I would take it as an indication of our respect um, and sort of professional, um, you know, relationship, but it, but it actually is a very good relationship. Yeah, but on, on behalf of the, the, you know, the flying public, <laughs> we want to encourage you to work together and to uh, continually improve the security system. Yeah, we do often spar over the facts, but I think the important part is, as you said, the suggestions we have, if they consider those seriously and where appropriate, implement them, that's the most important part at the end of the day, and hopefully that's what they'll walk away with from this. Great. Just a final question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kutz, you had said that uh, one of the recommendations to TSA was increased pat-downs. Uh, I'm just curious, is it a more comprehensive pat-down per incident, or is it more incidences of pat-downs that you're recommending? No, it's actually the pat-down being, uh, if I could say, a little bit more thorough. Thorough, okay. Yes. Got it. Thank you very much. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. We're being called to the House floor for a series of three votes, which uh, ought to bring us back here in uh, a half hour. So we're going to recess and then reconvene to uh, complete the hearing. So we stand in recess. <coughs> Oh gosh, you're part of oh. No, no, you're great. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Yarmouth, I want to recognize you for questions. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good almost afternoon now. Uh, I have to start by saying I'm a little bit uncomfortable with conversations like these, as I'm sure you are, uh, recognizing on the one hand our obligation to um, provide oversight on uh, airport security and also the issue of striking that very um, delicate balance between trying to make the public confident that we are doing what we need to be doing and also not scaring them to the point where they are afraid to fly. And I remember back in my journalist days, uh, back in right after the 9-11 crashes, and I was doing an interview with the director of the airport in Louisville and asked him, going through a number of the measures they were taking, whether these measures, in fact, were designed to provide real security or the illusion, the perception of security. And he was quite candid and said, this is basically to create the perception of security because 
uh, there is a limit to what we can do to provide real security, and I probably won't get any serious disagreement out of that, out of you on that. But with that premise, whether you accept it or not, uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions because we all go through security on a, on a weekly basis. And by the way, I will say the TSA people in, uh, in my airport in Louisville are uh, terrific. They work hard. They're very considerate. And um, I have no complaints about them. But it seems like a lot of the measures that are taken uh, are uh, don't focus on what you talked about, focusing on the priorities of not bringing a plane down, but to, again, create some kind of a, an illusion which, when you get behind them, don't make any sense. And this is going to sound a little trivial, but it's parochial and important to me. Um, we, ha we make Hillrick and Bradsby, we make Louisville sluggers at Hillrick and Bradsby in Louisville. And you can go on a tour of the museum there, and, and they sell souvenir baseball bats. The souvenir baseball bats are about 15 inches long and probably not much bigger around than this pencil. And you can't take them on a plane. Now, I, I would guarantee you, and there's a big display when you go through the TSA line, that uh, you can't bring these bats, little bats, on the plane. Now, I'll guarantee you I'm carrying, every time I'm on the plane, things that I could do more damage with than those baseball bats. And it seems to me that that is one of those instances in which we focus on things that don't make any sense, don't provide any security, and may in fact, if we're relying on people who are stressed and, hard and uh, have to cover a lot of people and so forth, we're making them deal with things that don't make any difference in the final analysis. Would you care to comment on, on that, Mr. Hawley? I think you've raised a number of good points, and specifically on that one, um, we are looking right now at the prohibited items list, and we're doing it in conjunction with our partners in Canada and uh, European Union and other places, so that we can have a common, um, a common framework. And as you know, we, we made the decision on um, scissors and small tools and recently um, the lighters based on risk management. So we are looking at, specifically we are looking at the baseball bats as well as the rest of the prohibited items list because we have to stay um, flexible, and again, I, I want to get away from the checklist mentality where we're just looking to, to take things away. We need to look for the person who's bringing a novel threat. And, and I guess the other question I would have is, and you may have alluded to this earlier, but it seems to me that the, in most cases, the greatest protection you would have in terms of things that go on in the passenger cabin are the other passengers. And not necessarily things that you would do going in. I mean, we, um, the, Richard Green was ultimately stopped because yeah. it was passenger pointed out that it was unusual that somebody would try to light his foot on a plane. Well, I'd like to address the charade issue because I hear it a lot. I see it on the blogs, and we we directly address that in the IED component piece because we could we can get high s scores on uh, testing, et cetera. But, but our officers know in reality what's real and what's charade. And in order to get them prepared and motivated and switched on to look for the, for, the, for, this, for the difficult threat, they have to believe that what we're really doing is security. So we've, we've really worked hard in the last couple of years to uh, openly communicate with our workforce about the threats. And what we do, we do because we believe it is a security matter. And we do need the support of the Congress and the public when we do change a security measure because you can always come up with a scenario that says, I can use X to do Y. And all of it is risk management. It's very difficult. Any one issue you can, you can fight over, but you have to fit the whole thing together. And I think it is a, is a pretty complex equation um, that it's important that we address these vulnerabilities publicly so the public knows what's involved. Well, and Along those lines, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever heard an announcement in, from a flight attendant inside a cabin about, and I know you don't want to make people so hypersensitive that they are, will report uh, things that are just normal behavior, but, and you get paranoid people, but that, that you, know, you need to be alert to what people are doing on the cabin, and if you see any suspicious activity to report it. Has there ever been any thought to, to utilizing the crew to actually enlist the passengers in those precautions? Well, certainly the crews are enlisted. We don't make any announcements. Actually, uh, we, you would be surprised. We probably get three or four a day 
of disruptive passengers uh, subdued by other passengers. So I think we, we, ha we all travel at a heightened sa state of alert, and I'm very confident, given the, the track record we have, that people doing suspicious activities are, in fact, reported. Okay. Thank, time's you, up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Westmoreland, I think you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Hawley, I just want to go back to a couple of things. Uh, uh, one was the point about whether this material that we saw in the video actually got on the plane or didn't get on the plane. And I think uh, it was Mr. Cooney that said it did get on the plane. And you said um, that uh, it may have, but not in a form that could have caused the damage. And you mentioned that there were some other points, I guess, between the screening uh, location and where it would have actually got on the plane. So. Are we to be under the assumption that these people would uh, prepare this thing prior to boarding the plane or once they boarded the plane? Of course, they could, they could attempt either. And the, from the checkpoint to the uh, boarding gate, there is a significant amount of security that is not seen. And as you know, we have a significant number of federal air marshals flying every day. They are undercover. They are in airport boarding gates, and part of their job is when they're not actually on the aircraft to be patrolling in those areas on the lookout for this. We know exactly what can bring a plane down. We know the characteristics of that chemistry and what you have to do to mix it properly. So there are some telltales um, that, that you can pick up on that, that would make it very, very difficult for someone to get away with it. I think the point Mr. Cooney raised on the aircraft in the restroom is something that, is, uh, that we pay attention to and certainly flying air marshals and flying flight crews pay attention to it, um, but, but we look at, we really look across the board. Okay. And, and, and let me ask you this. Uh, I, I think that you mentioned that um, there's been too much attention or TSA agents are having to pay too much attention to carry on baggage. And just from experience uh, uh, in, in doing quite a bit of flying, there are some people that carry on everything but the kitchen sink. And, uh, you know, supposedly it's a one bag carry on, one carry on, and, and one personal item. Uh, would it help if we start enforcing that uh, to where you could spend more time uh, on, the, on the person, uh, mm -hmm. on the physical person, rather than having to go through uh, all these uh, bag checks? I mean, some people get in line, they've got, you know, five of the gray trays and then some other stuff going through. When can we have some enforcement of that where you're kind of given a little more flexibility in looking at that individual? It's a shared responsibility with the airlines. And what we looked at this during the liquid plot with the, with the UK, they went to one bag, we did not. Our concern and my concern was you get a duffel bag and toss your, your two or however many it is in there and zip it up and say, voila, here's my one bag. And then that gets, um, that's too congested for us really to, to get a, an easy look. So you have to do a bag check and then that's a nightmare. So it really is, that's why I say partnering with the public that we have to fight through 10 million images a day and the extent to which the public can, can make them less cluttered, it gives terrorists less room to hide and it, it speeds the process. So you don't think that would be an alternative in trying to get sure, the airlines to more enforce uh, <coughs> uh, what they're doing? Yes, uh, I, would, I would focus on the weight. I think the weight is, is a bigger problem than the number because we, we injure our folks sometimes when picking up a bag and it's way too heavy. Um, but we have to operate in the world of, uh, that exists and, and not unduly do commerce. And our challenge is it's our job to find the bomb part no matter what is thrown at us. Um, and that's what we hold our, our officers to. I, and, and I know that you're uh, probably uh, going through, you know, all the training and trying to get everybody through the training. And I know that Mr. Micah had mentioned the behavioral um, mm -hmm. interviewing or whatever. And I'm sure that's a much more uh, uh, difficult process or more training that you have to send somebody through. And they probably have to have a certain tendency to be able to do that. But it does concern me that these tests were run uh, in, in several airports and, and you or the TSA doesn't seem to know if uh, this behavioral um, part ha ha was, was, was there and if it did any good or, or whatever. So 
and I know I don't know how much information y'all have shared back and forth about the test and the airports and you know who it was but I, I would like for you to comment sure. on that if you would yes it, it's a it's a key point but part of the protocol and and I respect the protocol is they don't give us advance notice so we don't know when they're coming and right. whether they know it's BDOs or not we in fact are working on tests of of what we call the behavior detection officers and it is we're finding it is difficult to simulate the actual stress of somebody with hostile intent. So we are working with other countries who have, a, who have uh, capability there, as well as with our uh, research arm of the department, to get the scientific data that will say how good our, our officers are just on the behavior. Well, and Mr. Hawley, I want to thank you for, for the job that uh, you're trying to do with TSA. I know it's a big, big uh, undertaking, and I appreciate you coming here today. I know it was probably similar to having a root canal, but uh, uh, I do want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Westmoreland. Mr. Shays? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, again for holding this hearing. Um, Mr. Hawley, I wouldn't want your job. Uh, I want to say that up front. I think it's one of the most difficult jobs. I think it's a no-win job. But um, I, I, I was uncomfortable with the morning part of this uh, hearing because I I felt like we were making, giving us a sense that we have 19 points, so they got through one, and that's not good, but don't lose sleep over it. Um, and I'm losing sleep over it, and I don't have your job. I want to be, uh, Mr. Kuntz, uh, uh, my understanding is you, you attempted 21 times to bring in explosive devices. Is that correct? It was 21 times in 2006 and 19 in 2007. Now, of the 21 times, uh, how many got through? I can't discuss that specifically. That's considered sensitive security information. Did a majority get in? I, I'm not supposed to. I, mean, Mr. I can uh, say we got says, through. Yield to me, sure. uh, 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 Mr. Davis and I uh, have had a briefing with the Intel people, and we didn't think it was productive to get into uh, any kind of numbers. I could offer that the that the learning the numbers are not necessary to get the learning from it, and there, and I think we derive a significant amount of learning, um, and so we would stipulate that there are learnings to be had regardless of. Okay, what I'm going to go under the assumption then, because I don't know that a majority got through, um, and given that, I would like to ask this question, Mr. Kunz. Uh, if you had got, attempted 19 times, 21 times and 19 times to get through, and none of them got through, would you have still written the report, and would we have been able to say to Mr. Hawley, uh, this is pretty fantastic, or when you have, uh, if you had had a total failure, would there have been no report? We always write the results of our work. That's part of our protocols, and we always go through the same briefings. Uh, we, we gave them all the details of where we went, what we did, several detailed briefings. We always report externally the results. Okay. Now, Mr. Hawley, I, I was uh, troubled by your comment that none of the uh, uh, weapons grade material, or the bombs got in because they weren't assembled. It seems to me like that's um, a lawyer talking instead of uh, the fact that uh, J.O. was able to get this weapon grade material through, they were able to get the detonation through. And uh, is that not correct? They were able to get it through the, and get it on the plane. Is that not correct, Mr. Hawley? You'd have to ask them as to what they actually did. But what, what, got, what got on the plane? Did you stop at the plane? The devices, that we, the devices we described, the uh, detonator, the liquid explosive, and the incendiary device and, and, components. And everything you showed us on the film uh, was what you got on. They say there's not two different examples. You didn't have a bigger explosive on the TV screen. What you got through was what you detonated or, or similar. Similar, yeah. correct. Um, what would have been involved with assembling the weapon? The bomb. We practiced uh, assembling the weapon. It took approximately 12 to 15 minutes. So that's, to put a, pretty, it together once. that's a pretty long time. Um, if you were to take that, if someone was sitting next to you, that would be a pretty difficult thing to assemble in front of someone, correct? If we were on the plane, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't assemble it in our seats. Uh, we would assemble it in another area of the plane. Okay. Let's just say you went to the restroom. Uh, would you have had to carry a case into the restroom? 
I can't uh, go into that, uh, Congressman, <laughs> based on uh, the confidentiality and the classification of the report. I'd be happy to discuss it with you in okay, a closed well, session. I, I guess what I want to know <laughs> is would it have been noticeable to a flight attendant or someone else that someone was having to carry on something that was, uh, was noticeable? Or would it have been able to have been disguised? It would have been disguised. Okay. So, Mr. Hawley, why should I take any solace in the fact that you uh, say, well, they, the, they weren't taken on the plane because they weren't assembled? Why, right. why is that meaningful? Thank you for asking the question. It, it, this is not an exact analogy, but it's like bringing the watch parts through and then saying I'm going to assemble it. Uh, bring the watch part through? Watch. You know, I have my yeah, watch okay. and I bring watch parts through. It is very sophisticated chemistry to uh, get the right, uh, the right everything as well as uh, certain matters of assembly. And there are some telltale indicators uh, when one is doing that. And it is not trivial to, uh, to assemble one of these things so that they work. And you have to ask yourself um, that uh, given the Richard Reed issue, um, there's a certain bar of effectiveness um, that they'd want to do before they would expose themselves to discovery, and that bar is reasonably high. Okay, well, I'll just end by saying um, it is unsettling to think that um, so much explosive device could get through, and uh, I make an assumption that a good amount did get through, and um, it, it, it's... Um, I would like to have thought that maybe one out of 19 or one out of 21 would have been the number. So um, I, I wish you well, and I hope that we're doing everything we can to help you succeed, Mr. Hawley. Thank you, thank Mr. Shaves. Uh, Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this bipartisan hearing. I, I think it's doing uh, uh, us a lot of good to at least make sure the American public understands the need for uh, ongoing improvement. Uh, I think. Maybe the administrator, maybe the kindest way to, to start this off is with something that will be good for the public. Uh, I had this shown to you earlier, uh, and it's entitled uh, Deluxe 16-Piece Carry-On Kit. And for the record, uh, if someone goes and buys one of these kits where they can get little teeny amounts of what they need to travel that may not otherwise be available or may cost a lot of money to buy, are they allowed to use that? Pretty much, yes. It's assuming it's got a zip top bag under there, which I believe it does. Right, but the, the yep. individual bottles yes, themselves. Sir. Yep. Okay. And I would hope that after today's hearing, universally, TSA people who don't get it, who routinely I have seen, because I travel every single week, twice a week, I've seen them turn people away with, oh, there's no marking on that. They do not seem to understand that, well, these are being sold, and well, in many cases, the only way and I, I don't want to sound sexist, but for a woman to have a multitude of different small items that, that may make up makeup needs and carry it on, they need to have that, uh, particularly if you look at what's often in a purse. So I, I see a lot of grinning by the men and women behind you, but I think it's important that when we say we care about commerce and we care about the traveler, that there be a uniform understanding that this doesn't have to be the answer, which is everything I took from the last hotel I stayed in. Uh, it was two days' worth. I didn't take any more than my share. Uh, but I think it is important because my line of questioning will not be on security. And, and it won't be on security because, one, uh, I spent time in the military and EOD, and I'm going to predict that 20 years from now, you're still going to be playing cat and mouse. Uh, we were playing cat and mouse with the SDS in the 1970s. It, it, I don't think it's going to change. Uh, having said that, I want to ask you a question, which is, given that we continue to fund you at the levels you request and that you continue to re ask for bucks for Buck Rogers type innovation, do you believe that you will reasonably be able to stay ahead of these ever moving and improving target uh, characteristics? I do, but it won't be through Buck Rogers technology. I think we have to have technology that is reliable, that is sophisticated, that is affordable. Um, but getting on the cutting edge of technology, I think, is uh, expensive, not reliable, and can usually be engineered around. So we'll always have the human factor. And I, I take your point about uh, you know, generational conflict. 
and that this is a long-term thing, and when we do something, they're going to react to get around it. And we have, and we've, therefore, for our technology purchases, you'll see fewer purchases of those big trace portals and more purchases of portable liquid explosive detectors, portable uh, explosive detectors that we're, in fact, using even with some of our foreign partners. So the flexible mix of technology and in a business process where our officers and all of our folks, including federal air marshals, can continue to adapt and not give the enemy a stationary target. I think that is the critical thing, and I don't think it's going to, we're not going to have a silver okay. bullet. Okay. Uh, because you're, you, you, you kind of led into this, uh, you're going to be a labor-intensive labor industry for a while, uh, for the foreseeable future, that technology per se is not going to eliminate the need for the men and women in uniform uh, who handle the luggage, look through it, or who, out of uniform, plain clothes, who observe after you go through the primary checkpoint. Then can I ask for something very straightforward in this hearing, because this is the government oversight and reform. Mm -hmm. I travel throughout Europe and the Middle East, uh, but usually go through Europe commercially on my way to the Middle East. For some reason, the Europeans have figured out that to have a TSA equivalent person shuttling little gray trays back and forth is a huge waste of a trained individual. I travel through Dulles, I travel through uh, uh, San Diego, Sacramento, a number of other airports. They all vary, but none of them reach the level of moving the trays from where they get left off back to the other without human intervention, meaning that in every one of your airports, you've got somebody like the uniformed person behind you who is doing an, a task that requires absolutely no training, absolutely no expertise for which we are paying for training and expertise. And I would hope that you would commit to us to make the dollars available to automate the trays or the equivalent so that we not waste valuable government employees on something that, quite frankly, anybody can do and no one should have to do in this automated day and age. Yes, that's the perfect use of technology to, uh, to make it more efficient. Totally agree. Thank you. I'll end on that high note, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Isep. I want to, uh, uh, Mr. Kurtz, last year GAO conducted a, a similar undercover uh, operation and managed to get liquid explosives past security checkpoints in all 21 airports you tested. In February of 2006, when GAO completed its investigation, uh, there wasn't a public hearing such as we're having today. Instead, GAO privately briefed TSA officials, including Mr. Hawley, on its results. Mr. Coates, in your February 2006 briefing with Mr. Hawley, did you warn him about the vulnerabilities your uh, tests had exposed? The February 06 briefing, we did not have liquid explosives on the 2006 testing. It was the other two devices, the incendiary and the IED detonator we showed today. The liquid explosives were on the work we did for your committee as part of the 07, so we did not do that. They were certainly aware, as Mr. Hawley said, that liquid explosives are a significant risk here, uh, and that was one of the reasons, I think, that we uh, attempted to do that as part of our second test for your committee. Mm -hmm. But you did brief him on, on what you had found in your investigation. In 06, that's correct. In 06. Yes. And following your uh, briefing to TSA, did TSA change its policies or procedures to fix the gap in security that your tests highlighted? I don't think any procedures were changed. What they represented to us, that people were alerted to what we did, and there was additional training on it. That's what we understood happened after the last report. Instead, Homeland Security Department officials made statements to the press criticizing the GAO investigation, saying that they were a bit far-fetched. Mr. Hawley, you were quoted in an NBC story as saying, TSA wasn't interested in materials that would set off an interesting firework display in an aircraft but can't bring the, the plane down. Mr. Coates, do, do you think the substances that GAO smuggled in were nothing more than fireworks, as Mr. Hawley had suggested? Well, I would go back to the video we showed. The first video of the automobile trunk and floor of the automobile being blown out, that was the item we brought on in 2006. And the incendiary device that was the intense heat burning was the other device we brought on. Whether they would bring down an aircraft or not, I don't know, but they would certainly threaten the passengers and could cause serious damage. But do you and think that, that they were minimizing the true dangers uh, with that uh, statement? To call it a science experiment or something, I think that trivializes it, yes. Uh, Mr. Hawley, 
uh, you, do, you appear to think that these GAO tests are insignificant. You say that you're only focused on the serious threats. We all just saw the video of the explosions, and that is a serious threat. In this morning's Washington Post, this is what TSA says, there is nothing in the report that is news to us. Last year, you failed to prevent explosives from getting onto airplanes. You promised to improve your performance. But now we learn that GAO is again able to bring explosive, uh, explosive materials onto planes. The problem is that the news is the same. It's not getting better, and that's unacceptable. You're failing. Here's what else TSA said. We don't change security procedures in knee-jerk fashion. Uh, GAO's re first report was issued in February 2006. That was 19 months ago. I want to know what you're doing, what you're going to change now so that we're not here next year facing exactly the same situation. Sure. I appreciate the question, and the, the answer is that all this training I was talking about in terms of, of the checkpoint drills that we now do throughout the system every day, that is added, and I believe that is probably the best thing that we can do at this point. It is actually from our own covert testing, which drills down into the specifics of the vulnerability. That was identified, and they recommended um, this, and we followed the recommendations of our covert testers. And I think um, the technical issues about what the GAO test, tested um, are a separate debate, and we probably don't completely agree on it. However, the result of it, I take. I think it is a valuable lesson to learn, and the issue of explosives or homemade chemicals, whether they work or don't work, we have to be alert to it. I should also say, as I said in my opening, that, that I identified and TSA identified those vulnerabilities in 2005. So we know what the vulnerabilities are, and as I laid out, we have put in place um, quite a few measures, and I think I've provided the committee with that, that are, are directed at improvement. And have we closed the vulnerability? No. But we do 2 million passengers a day, and 38 tests over three months is probably not statistically significant. It is directionally significant, and I think we have to take it um, as valuable input. But it is not something on which the public should panic or should be concerned about the overall system. It is, it, these are known vulnerabilities. The GAO is helping us in terms of addressing them, and, and that's really what the story is. Well, last year you said you were going to do more training of personnel as well. Uh, I, I guess the, the point I want to drive home is that we're going to ask for this GAO report again next year, and you're on notice. And we don't want to have to hold a hearing where we get a report that GAO came in and gave us a, a, a very discouraging picture. And we don't want TSA to minimize it. We don't want to scare people, but I don't want you to minimize it. I think you should take this one seriously. I and uh, I. I didn't feel that you took the first one as seriously as you should. So I, I, I hope that um, we can continue to talk about all the efforts that are going to be made to uh, assure the public in, in reality that as many of the vulnerabilities as we face are going to be uh, reduced and that, uh, that we're going to get safer and safer in our transportation. I can assure you that everybody at TSA has no question about the seriousness with which I take IED penetration drills and the, the significance of this. So, yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Davis, any further I just comments? Got a couple. Um, I want to clarify a point that was talked about earlier. Uh, Mr. Harley, as you understand it, and then I'll ask Mr. Cooney, Mr. Uh, uh, Cuts to comment, was what um, the GAO got past security the same elements that were in the video played earlier? What's your understanding? My understanding was that they were, in fact, different. Okay. Mr. Cooney, Mr. Cutts, were they were the same as in the video. Okay. Yes, Mr. Cooney is one of the ones that actually did the testing. So he has firsthand knowledge of what was brought on the plane because he's one of the ones that had it in his bags and on his person. Okay. I, I think the issue, um, it's not a trivial issue in the sense that as we evaluate the layers of security, if, in fact, what you brought to the checkpoint was, um, was able to blow up a plane, th that's one thing. And y if you have well, to they do... they never said it was able to blow the plane up. They obviously would cause damage, right? But, but no, no, there's no allegations here that would blow the plane up. That's correct, sir. Yeah. So I think I, I would just stand with, with I mean, you our... You could open up the door, the emergency door in the plane, and do damage as well. And this is my... So we, that's, I think they were very careful not to make the allegation it would blow it up. Oh, go ahead. I, I think we are, the, the key point for the public is that we are 
in agreement on the need to continue to close down vulnerabilities everywhere in the system. I think the, the differentiation is, I'm, because of the distinctive nature of the video, people say, oh my goodness, this could happen to my plane. And the situation, that is not what is actually portrayed in this data. The data r points out and recognizes vulnerabilities that we recognize exist, they discover they exist, and, and we all agree they need to be closed. Um, TSA has recognized the threat of explosive bomb components being brought on board uh, in carry-on bags some time ago. You spent millions of dollars funding the development of a high-quality um, auto-explosive detection system uh, to meet the threat, a technology that is now successfully used to screen check baggage. Is that correct? And now recently carry-on baggage. Okay. What, why, why is your agency done to advance this type of technology at a passenger screening checkpoint? The Science and Technology Division of, the, of DHS uh, does the R&D for the department. And my understanding is they put something close to a billion dollars of investment into the IED uh, research and development area. The key point for us is the R&D discoveries in the next short period of time aren't immediately deployable. Our job is to use what is available today to limit the gaps until future technology is developed. So you're using AT machines yes, today. Sir as opposed to the, the EDS? Well, we'd because like to use both. The, we, we, there's the, the old-fashioned x-ray, which is a single source. Right. That's, uh, it, it, the AT machines, I understand it, don't provide a 360-degree view. No, but, but they can get pretty close. And they don't provide a 3D image for the screeners to view the baggage. That's correct, as far as I know. But they do provide a cheaper price. Exactly. And, and we can deploy them extraordinarily widely, um, and they have very low maintenance, and, and so that's a factor. I think a mix is important. The, the auto EDS, as they call it, very excellent technology. We're buying 20 more, I, I hope, in 2008. And the, uh, but if we can get 500 of the ATs out, that, that covers a lot of ground and is upgradable over time with better software. So I think that's a good business decision. For 2007, the President initially requested 80 0.52 million for emerging technologies, is my understanding. In addition, he requested $25 million for checkpoint explosives detection equipment and pilot screening technologies in the emergency supplemental for a total of $105 million for emerging technologies in 2007. Congress provided the requested funds, but the agency still only spent $50 million on the emerging uh, technology, uh, checkpoint technologies. Is that I don't have those exact, those numbers don't match what I have uh, in my head. I, I clearly can go back and, and reconcile. I guess the question is, we, pr we provided uh, close to $105 million. Yeah. My understanding is this has not all been spent. I guess what we'd like to know uh, from, from a committee perspective is what hasn't it, been spent, why not, what's in the pipeline, just so. I, I can, um, I'll have to get back to you on, right. the, on what has been spent. We've got, we've asked for 136 million in checkpoint technologies. It's, it's, a, it's a perhaps different category than what you're talking about. Um, but we, we have significantly spent in that area and we, we used up to buy the 250 AT machines, I believe what we had in 07. I'll have to, I'll have to confirm those numbers but we have continued to uh, request significant additional funds in 08. And the last thing I'd ask is, how are we in coordination with other nations at this point? Some of them have, um, uh, you, you know, ma many of them are not as strict as we are, uh, but they're subject to the same kind of uh, vulnerabilities that, that we yes. are. How is that coordination? I, I think that is absolutely critical, because if, if we get our uh, U.S. Domestic secure and somebody's able to board a flight overseas and hijack it or, or blow it up. That's the same result So we depend on our international partners and we've created a new um, Group at TSA that does this global strategy and we moved our head of Intel Intelligence to the head of that so that he would have the credibility with other nations in discussing security matters to for instance on shoes um, We we feel very strongly about shoe screening and working with our partners to do shoe screening is something that's not popular, but we think, think is effective from a security point of view. So I think over the next five years and beyond, the degree to which U.S. security measures tie in with our international partners is a big opportunity yeah. and important. Uh, well, no question, but I guess my question is, how is that partnership? How, oh, how, are, it, how are, are they all responding? Are we having some that are balking a little bit at it? Uh, we have... Um, 
we have extraordinary cooperation with, um, with our neighbors to the north and south, Canada and Mexico, the European Union, clearly the UK we are very close with. Um, I've just returned from uh, working with some of our Asian partners and I expect that that uh, closes the loop. The big opportunities are in Africa and South America and uh, there are a lot of governments there that want to do first-rate security and our job is to give them the training and something that's accessible. And we can't give them million dollar pieces of equipment and say we want you to deploy this. We have to find things that are less expensive but do provide security value that can in fact be deployed in, in, uh, around the world. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, I want to thank the three of you for your presentations to us and the GAO for your excellent work. We hope that next year when we look at a GAO report, we're gonna see a lot of improvement and we'll have better news, because at this time of year, people want the good news and uh, their anxieties eased. There, there are too many vulnerabilities, and we want those vulnerabilities uh, fixed. Thank you very much. Uh, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I'm so tired. I don't even know if I can. On today's Washington Journal, we'll review CNN's Democratic presidential debate with David Mark of the Politico. Also, Congressman Vito.